power. But in 2003, there was something changed. This is the small group of people that were working full time on Firefox when we released Firefox 1.0. And uh, this, is, this is me in those earlier days and, uh, and the team of, of people that were working. It's a little, little bit blurry there on the image. You can see, uh, you know, I was also the director of IT and like here's the, here's the internet wire that like we strung out of the ceiling. And so that was one of the first things that happened when, when we started uh, being able to grow the Mozilla Foundation is I lost my job as the IT director. Started working on other stuff. But it wasn't just that small group of 10 or 12 people working full time. It was a whole community of people that helped us localize Firefox into 24 different languages and now it's expanded to 85 different languages. All of that is volunteer work, all these translations. It was people, it was a, it was a million people that helped us test those early versions of Firefox to know that they worked with the web. Um, it, was, it was also, we also had people that would volunteer time to help other users and, and create a support site for Firefox. And then there were users that started to adopt Firefox. And so it was just this layers of community that slowly built out, doing things well beyond um, uh, just developing the software. And so that's this little orange area here is the initial start of the growth of Firefox around 2004, early in 2004. And you can see by the time uh, 2005 came around, we, we, almost, we had almost 100 million users. We, all, we had almost 100, the same number of users that Netscape had in those early days of the web down here. And we, and we changed the dynamic. We, people started using Firefox as their web development tool. How many of you are web developers? And yet, do you use Firefox to help test websites and then you go back and you check Internet Explorer? Because because then you can be assured that it's going to be work across multiple browsers. And so here's what the landscape looks like today, where we've got, a, we've got, we have Firefox, we've got Chrome, we've got Safari, and we still have Internet Explorer losing market share. And so this is the web that we, that we, that we tried to create back in those very early days of the Mozilla Foundation. A web that was open and many companies and, and developers could participate in, in driving the direction. It's not just dominated by one company, like Microsoft. So how many are you of Firefox users? And how many are using the latest versions of Firefox? So I'd encourage you all to try out Firefox 10. That was the latest version just released a few weeks ago. And um, you can, because one of the, if you're web developers, one of the major things that we've been working on is improvements to the developer tools. How many of you are use Firebug? So Firebug started out as a community project, and um, then, the, then the developer who was working on it kind of got tired, and we kind of let, let technology lag. And it's very important that we've got good developer tools because that's our vision for the web, is that we want to see, um, see people develop the web as a platform that can replace proprietary games, can replace pr proprietary video. Uh, so so here's, uh, you know, here's an article that talks about the developer tools that have gone into Fire, to, to Firefox 10. Uh, and so we're, we're working on slowly replacing all of the functionality of Firebug plus adding a lot of new features. And uh, so you can start to see those. So there's a new web developer menu bar here. And you can use our new developer tools to inspect any web page. So I'm just going to take this random web page that I can see and I can go around and I can expect, inspect all of the divs on the page. I can see how the web page is all laid out. And I can also go down here and I can get a 3D view of the web, of, 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 e of each web page to kind of give me a much better idea of how the web page is, is constructed. I can see all the components of the web page and I, can, and I can inspect each one of them. 
And you can, you can see off here, there's a bunch of, uh, you know, tr probably tracking cookie images that are kind of anonymously set up in the content. So these developer tools are intended for us to, to really take a look at uh, how, how web pages are constructed and, al and allow people to play with them and see them and use those same techniques on, on their own sites. So how many of you are contributors to the Mozilla project? So there's one, two, two guys here. I'm going to try and convince you that you're all contributors and you all play a role in the, in the development. So how many of you have helped someone else use Firefox? You've told your friends or family. So that is the, that's the way that Firefox has grown in Brazil and all over the world. The Mozilla Foundation doesn't spend hardly any money on marketing campaigns. We don't do TV commercials. We haven't had billboards. We, um, uh, it's a grassroots effort of contributors like you that have learned about Firefox, started using it, and then you tell your friends or your family. And it's, so it's not just about writing code. It's, it, it's, it's about many different ways to contribute to Firefox. And now we have over 7 million people every day using Firefox just in Brazil. And you can see it's been a steady growth curve. Um, you know, this goes back to 2008, and you can see how it's grown. We've slowed down a little bit in the last couple of years. Uh, Google is spe spending hundreds of millions of dollars on worldwide campaigns to promote Chrome. And so that's, that's, that's created greater awareness around browsers, which is a good thing. Uh, but it slowed us down a little bit. But, but just market share is not the only thing that we're after. We're only after market share so that we can continue to influence the direction of the web. And you can see the different, we, in this data, every day when you start up Firefox, it checks for, to see if there's an update, and that's how we measure this. And we can, we can kind of monitor, you know, these dips, these dips right here are, uh, are the Christmas holidays, and then the secondary dips, this one and this one, I can tell the exact hour that Carnival starts in Brazil because everyone stops using the internet. So even this guy uh, is a Firefox supporter, and this guy. But most important, it's people like you. It's, it's, it's people like Fabricio here, who's been a long time Mozilla supporter and developer on the web and using our tools, providing feedback to the way that the browser should look. And it's all of you. It's all of you that have told your friends and family and created this interest and growth around Firefox that has caught people's at attention across the world. So I want to thank all of you, and you should all give yourself a round of applause for contributing to Mozilla and Firefox. So what if we were able to like, have $100 million and spend on marketing campaigns? What would those campaigns look like? Like, what if we put up billboards uh, to, to promote Firefox. We'd have to figure out what kind of story that we want to tell. You know, I guess we would talk about all of the memory improvements and, and performance improvements that we've made just in the last six months in Firefox since releasing Firefox 4. We're re releasing at a much faster pace now. And we're trying to really focus on trying to make the browser very stable and fast and secure. And we talk about the way that we, that we see the internet evolving now and what challenges we're going to see in the future. And we talk about, like, what is the next round of battles? The first round of battles was to stop uh, Microsoft from including the browser into the operating system and having only one kind of browser. But there's different kind of browsers now. We have all kinds of different kind of devices connecting to the web and different operating systems. So in 2000, it was just the browser and the OS. But now, in, two, in 2011, 2012, we've got the OS and the browser, but we've also got companies controlling the devices and the services that you connect to. If you think about your iPhone, it, Apple owns every single layer of that stack. 
They, uh, they make the device, they put the operating system on it, they control the browser, and all of the services that you connect to, to get your music or to, or to get apl other applications, you go through Apple. Apple controls all of those choices for you, and they lock you into that platform. And it's kind of the same as well with Google and Android. So the, the, those companies are battling to control all those layers. And so our challenge now at Mozilla is to find out ways that we can open up every single layer of that stack. We can work with device manufacturers to, for them to create and open devices. We can, we can use Linux, we can use uh, kernels from open source to create this OS layer. And we can add the browser in there in a way that allows people to extend and modify and control the browser. But we also need to start to experiment with open services that allow distributed applications or applications to be distributed in a wide way uh, that allows people more choice in the stores that they go to for applications. So it's a much bigger challenge for us and it's areas where we really haven't um, stepped into as an open source community and, and, and at Mozilla. So you can see what's going on just by the way that Apple talks about their product releases now. So here, just last year at Apple's developer com conference, they talked about the end of the PC computing era and how that's changing the, the landscape. And they talked about how, how they saw that this would evolve. It, it would people being automatically connected to Apple servers and files and, uh, and, and, and your data would only be available uh, on Apple devices. And that's not the internet that, that, we, that we hope that will come, come true. So, so we really need to get busy. As an open source community, we need to find ways that we can open up every layer of the stack. Because we're, we're kind of behind the game at this point. Another story we would tell around, around security and privacy. That's one thing that differentiates the way that uh, we, we, we think about the Internet at Mozilla and large commercial companies. Think about it. Um, Apple, Facebook, Google, they're all interested in gathering as much information and controlling as much information as they can about every one of their users. And we're, at Mozilla, we're not so interested in that. We're, we're interested in users being able to control their personal data, where it lives, how it's used, and, and being able to have a say in how, how privacy works. Um, there, was a in, there was a security researcher that spoke at Mozilla recently. His name is Moxie Mylenspike. And he talked about these changing threats to privacy. And he's done a very good job of articulating what these threats are. And he tells a story about how in 2001, there was this U.S. government program uh, to gather and store email, browsing history, credit card info, medical records. They wanted to create this giant government database of all of this information. And they wanted to tap phone lines. They wanted to tap internet lines. And they wanted to populate all of this information into this giant database. And the name of the program was called Total Information Awareness. And so all of this data would be controlled by the government. And it, it started out first as a secret program. And then some members of the U.S. Congress found out about it. And they flipped out. They said, you know, we don't want the government intruding in every aspect of our Internet lives. And they were able to shut down the program very quickly. And so now, um, you know, one of the aspects of this program, too, was they, they even created this logo for the program where they have the, the eye of God looking down on the entire planet, under, trying to understand everything that was going on. And this is the uh, John Poindexter, who was the, the head of this program. Uh, he was an advisor to Reagan and... Uh, ...scandal. Uh, so very controlling government figure at the head of this program. So we don't have that now. We don't have 
uh, this, this scary government program run by scary government ad administrators. But what do we have? We have Google and Facebook and Twitter that have these famous celebrity CEOs that everyone looks up to and admires. We have uh, companies that have made billions of dollars. But it's through more subtle options. If you look at what Google is doing and you compare it to that total information awareness program, Google is capturing all of your email. It's capturing all your browsing habits through Google Analytics. It has your credit card history. It has your medical records. So the valuation of companies now is, is starting to uh, reflect this idea that the more data that they can gather, the higher the value of the company. And the, 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 one of the troubling things is also um, the, the, the attitudes that they have around user privacy. So, and this started way back at Sun. This is a statement from Scott McNeely back in 1999, is that, you know, this idea that you've got user, you've got zero privacy when you're on the web, so, so get over it. And now Mark Zuckerberg, it's like he's trying to convince people that having a lack of privacy is really okay. And he wants people to think that people have just gotten used to, and that's just the way that it's going to be, and that's just the way that it is now. And it's the social norm that, you're, that people are willing to give up any data, all data about themselves. Um, and then you've got um, Eric Schmidt at Google saying, uh, you know, if there's something that, you're, that you don't want people to know about, then maybe you sh shouldn't want to be doing it. But that doesn't reflect the idea about this misinterpretation of your browsing habits and the data that they collect. That's really the danger, is that someone will take that data, they'll misinterpret it, and they'll misclassify it, and then you're, you'll end up trying to fix those problems. And then there's this idea from Zuckerberg about privacy anxiety. And they're creating a new language to describe this fear that people have about losing their privacy. So what can we do to turn around the thinking of people, of people that are working inside these companies and to have them ref more reflect these privacy concerns? So we need to stop this race to the bottom of, 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 of companies being valued based on how much data they can collect. And that's actually like not sustainable that eventually people are going to turn against this idea and they're going to stop using those services. And we need to figure out a way to, to, to bring back uh, the voice of users in this privacy debate and not just having companies like uh, Facebook characterize uh, what privacy should look like. So we need to change the terms of debate. And one way that we can do that is to create a privacy bill of rights. So here's some things that, that, that might be in that Bill of Rights. The idea that it's people don't really want to connect to Facebook. They want to connect to their friends. And Facebook should be a service that allows that and provides that, but under, under the user's control. And that, so they should have all the control over their own data. And that sites shouldn't collect more data than they really need or store it for longer than it's really needed. And users should have the ability to remove all the data from their sites whenever they want to and however they want to. And they should be able to move it from one site to another depending on their choices. And there should be many choices available in distributed services. We shouldn't have these centralized social networks where everything happens within this uh, um, uh, this, this, you know, one service or another. And uh, we should have the ability to move our data around and have portability. So, so here's some examples of things that we're working on at Mozilla to try and promote those pr principles. So f first of all, how many of you use Firefox Sync? So there's a few here. 
I'd encourage you to kind of check out. So it's a way of having your data stored in the cloud, but it's more under your control. So what we do in Firefox is that we gather up um, the add-ons that you use, your browsing history, passwords, and all of that is encrypted on your personal computer. And then, you can, and then it automatically syncs up to uh, servers run by Mozilla, but it's encrypted in a package that we can't look at. So we can't, under, we can't see what your passwords are, we can't see what your browsing history are, is. Um, all of that data is, is still under your control. Um, and so the, 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 the first um, response that many, we talked to many websites about using this idea is that anything in, that goes into the cloud ought to be encrypted and it ought to be under user control. And they said that encryption is just too slow. It won't work. Well, now we have, we have millions of people using Firefox Sync. And so we have a demonstration of how you can apply encryption, how you can keep that data under user control, um, and, and a solution that works. So we're, we've, we're proving, them, we're proving the, these large companies wrong in cases where they, they, they're, they're choosing to ignore this idea. Another thing, how many of you use the feature in Firefox called Do Not Track? A couple. We have over 6 million Firefox users using this feature. It just got released in Firefox 4 and it's been out there for a few months. So what Do Not Track is about is about sending a message. Every time that you, your browser asks for a website, it sends a little message along with that uh, request to the website that says, I don't want to be tracked. I don't want you to, s to store information about how I'm using your site, and I want control over that. Um, and we really don't have a definition for what do not track means at this point. At this, at this point, it's just you telling what your preference is, because that's one of the hard things that we've seen with websites is that um, they say, well, no, no, this is all too confusing. We just need to do what we want to do to meet our business goals. And, that, and, then, and they also have this idea that people really aren't concerned with security and privacy. And privacy especially. They say like, you know, only a very small percentage of people. But we want to change that. We want to make people aware that privacy is important and there's ways that they can participate in this debate. And so if you go into your browser, you can see this setting under the privacy area. And you, all you got to do is just check this box and then you'll start to send this message every time that you visit websites. And then we're going to encourage those websites to go back and look and, and find out how many of their users really are interested in privacy and, how, and get them to think more about how they can design every single one of their services in a, in a way that protects privacy to a greater degree. So just to wrap up, so the things that we're doing, you know, I, I encourage you, like, don't give up your, private, your anxiety over privacy. Like, continue to be concerned about it. Can do, set do not track and start to tell websites that you're concerned about it. And help us to work on these features in the browser. Give us feedback about how they get in your way, how we can, how we can modify it. Uh, there's a variety of ways that you can give feedback. Um, uh, if you're using the beta versions, there's a little button that all you got to do is click a button and summarize. You can write us a little message. Uh, we have people that are translate all that stuff from Portuguese into English so it can be shared with a lot of the developers around the world. Um, and, uh, and we're really interested in having Firefox to, comp to continue to be the way that users can have impact into the direction of the web. So thank you very much for, for coming out and listening to a little bit about how we think about the browser at Mozilla. And uh, thanks again for the way that you participate in, in creating awareness around uh, Firefox in Brazil. I think we probably have time for a few questions if you have any, or, we, or you can just come up and talk to me later. So uh, you said about uh, an operating system from Mozilla. 
uh, when going to be released on a uh, beta test for users? Um, yeah, so we have, we have several different kinds of early test releases now. Uh, we've changed the way that we release software. So we always have a beta test version that's, that's, um, that's available. And we also have like a, a, a early beta that we call Aurora. Um, and so if you go to the Mozilla website, uh, you'll be able to see um, the, uh, where, where to download those. Um, yeah, here's the... Yeah, these are the these are the logos that you can look for on the website. Oh yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I have a development for Firefox uh, on Bug Z Bugzilla, uh -huh. and so, the, but I didn't see anything about the the oper operation system, and so what I want to know is uh, it's going to be uh, based on browser like right. Google is doing, or it's going to be uh, like a Linux kernel and Right, like a, a GNU. Right, it's um, we're taking pieces of Android that have already been developed and are and are available in open source and, and fairly up to date, and that's kind of going to be the kernel of of what we call this boot to gecko project, which is Mozilla's attempt to you know have an operating system and, and then the Mozilla browser that sits on top of that, and that's kind of the user interface layer. And this is going to be more f uh, uh, free than Android yes. because yeah. we I have mean some problems with Android. Uh, some people are, are working to get this free and the real GPL license. Right. Uh, yeah, that, and I mean that's the problem with Android. That's the frustration that we had as, as developers who wanted to get Firefox onto Android is that we, we can't track with the operating system. Google develops Android and they call it open source. But all they do is just they, they take a, what they've developed and they throw it over the wall. So there's no way for developers to par across the web to participate and check in patches and know what the latest versions look like. And we want to change that. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again for coming out. Uh, I think, is there anybody else? Okay. All right. Thanks again.